One fly in the ointment has been September's CPI report, of course, which suggests that the Fed is going to have to keep going to get um, to get inflation levels where they want them to be. The Fed continuing its data-driven approach. And so there's a lot of questions about whether they're behind the curve. Joining us now to discuss all of this, BlackRock's global fixed income CIO, Rick Reeder. Hey, Rick. How are you? Nice to see you in person. Thanks for having me. So we have this sort of um, bounce that we're seeing in the market here and this debate now about whether it's going to be sustained, whether this is another head fake. What do you think? So I, I don't think you can count on the market continuing to have, by the way, it's nice being here on a green day. We don't get many of those these <laughs> yeah. days. The, uh, but, you know, I think it's hard to count on sustained this being sustained. You've got a Fed that's still tightening financial conditions. You've got inflation that's still running too hot and they've got to keep moving. I think that the markets are priced in about as far as the Fed is going to go. But you don't know the answer to that yet. And, you, and until we get more data, you've got you know, We just came off a strong CPI report. We came off a strong payroll report. You know, now all eyes turn to the employment cost index, PCE data. And, you know, we need to see it start to trend down for the Fed to come off this. And then it's hard to, to take a lot of risk until that happens. Has it been encouraging to you, though, Rick, that we've seen the market rally uh, in response to earnings that aren't necessarily great? Goldman, Bank of America, they were OK. You know, they weren't as bad as feared. But even go back to last week, you saw some hot reads on inflation. The market bounced on that num- those numbers as well. Those, to me, seem like positives. Uh, they definitely do. And by the way, the bank earnings are pretty good. Pretty good. I mean, when you, when you break it down, those are pretty good. You also had a big relief off of this dynamic that was happening in the UK. I mean, this mm-hmm. unwind of the leverage in the pension system was incredibly dislocating. The impact it was having on rates in the UK and then infecting the US and, and Europe, that was a big deal. Listen, I think, I think you've got to, the, the equity market has some pretty sizable short positions in it today. And I think people underestimate uh, how much the market has gotten gotten repositioned around equities, and you're seeing some pretty big put option trading, very big and positions, and short interest that's pretty sizable. And so the, the technicals in the equity market are pretty darn good today. So you get these bounces, and my sense is you'll keep getting them. But you know, can you count on a sustained rally? I think it's still it's still early to think that. I want to pick up on the point about the UK for just a second, because there was more news out this morning. The Financial Times said they were going to delay their quantitative tightening. Then the Bank of England says, no, we're not necessarily going to delay it. Um, but I've been sort of struggling to some extent to, to understand the interplay between what's going on in the UK and here. Yeah. Um, so can you sort of lay that out for us and why it is so important what's happening? 100 percent. So you've got you've got a dynamic in the UK, which is extraordinary in that you had what appeared to be at the time in aggressive fiscal easing. At the same time, you were seeing central bank tightening. That is not nobody in, the, in history has ever seen that work out. So that was creating this volatility in the markets. But then you have a dynamic that you had this leverage unwind. You have these pension funds had to sell huge amounts of assets including long-term interest rates, interest rate products generally. And so what happens is the developed market interest rates, markets tend to work together. Mm -hmm. And so that was putting pressure on the markets here. And then just the general dislocation, you know, London is is the second epicenter of finance. And as you're getting this extraordinary volatility there, and it was permeating all the markets generally. So by the way, you know, when the central banks raised rates this much and tightened liquidity, you see the, the, the leverage, you know, every, you know, I would say every day, but periodically you see, wow, I didn't realize that risk was on. I didn't realize this leverage is on. And we're going to keep getting reminders of that for the, for the coming weeks and months. Like I say, I hope that, you know, the Fed is going to reach a point where they could pause at these elevated rates, whether that's four and a half, four and three quarters, five. You know, once they pause, then you could start to get comfortable. Gosh, I'm going to take some more risk in my portfolio, but I'd like to see some better data to allow us to think that. Following up on something that you just mentioned a moment ago, where are you seeing the largest volume of kind of outsized short positions right now? I mean, the overall market, I mean, the size, I was looking at the size of put options trading for for a week straight. You're talking about about a trillion dollars worth of of notional puts. So by the way, to put that number in perspective, the high yield markets, the U.S. high yield market's a trillion and a quarter. A trillion a day of put options are trading. Now, that's full notional size, so they obviously trade on a delta basis lower than that but that's that is big and then i look at exposures across a lot of the what is faster money hedge fund type and that's really low in terms of exposure and i think money managers have brought down their exposure pretty significantly so you know that is significant and that's where i think you've got a market that once it jumps you get some short covering that comes in or so people people worry that they're going to miss it 
like I said, I don't think they're going to miss it, but it's not to say, you know, you go through periods where you have real bear markets, you get these spiked rallies. You mentioned a minute ago um, that in periods like this, we start to see where the leverage is in the system, where the risk is in the system. Where do you have your eyes on that we might see more signs of that? So, you know, there's something really different than 15, 20 years ago when you had the big subprime crisis and you had leverage in the financial system, corporates, households. You actually don't have that today. The banks are in good shape from a leverage perspective. Corporates are, households are in good shape relative to what they've been in history. You know, the one place you got to keep your eye on is the real estate market, so commercial real estate, residential real estate. You know, that's where you have financing, not just leverage, but you've got to roll over your financing. And so the way commercial real estate projects work, obviously, Resi, is you've got to roll over your financing. And that, that's, that's where you can get some tricky things. And you, by the way, you've seen it. You know, we, we're, we've been buying AAA commercial mortgages and getting close to six and a half, and you know, there's one piece we bought close to 7%, triple A. You know, so you think about subordinated debt underneath that. So when that happens, you start to think about, gosh, if I can buy triple A asset, that sort of yield, why would I take much risk otherwise? Well, the other, the other difference between now and then, though, is that you have a lot more private credit companies right. that are not the banks. Are they a source of risk at all in this environment? I would say generally not because they're liabilities. They're usually locked up money. Usually they've gotten that money for a longer period of time. So I don't generally don't think that they are significant risks to unwind. You know, there are structures that take place in the market that are, um, you know, in and around, you know, some of the CLO markets or otherwise that you got to keep your eye on. But I would say generally the private financing generally is pretty well termed out in terms of in terms of where that capital has been raised. So I don't think that's a stress point today. But like I say, guaranteed, whenever you get this sort of shock to the system, something's going to pop up that you didn't expect. And you know, similar to what happened in the UK. I mean, who would have thought in the UK you'd have an issue in the pension system? And that, that's but that is illustrative of what happens in these situations. Right, let's say on financial stability, a competitor puts out a put out a survey this morning. Uh, lots of charts in there is noting worsening risks to financial stability now weighing on equities. But you don't, see, you don't see that. This is not great recession stuff we're seeing right now in the markets. It's great recession in terms of, uh, in terms of the economy slowing? or it's... I mean, not, we don't see the same things in, in housing. I mean, it's not a, no. the same situation. We just see stock prices going down. Right. I, so, listen, I mean, it's, it's been historic in 50 years, probably longer than that. You've never seen rates and risk go down at the same time. And that is, I mean, that is a, an illustration of the fastest tightening we've ever seen by the central banks in history. By the way, not just, not just the US, but the emerging markets, the ECB, uh, the Bank of England. So that is just what happens on the backside of it. And, you're, and it's just not clear how much the economy is gonna slow on the backside of it. What we are seeing that I think is encouraging is you're starting to see the goods part of the economy come down a bit, and that, that is healthy. You're seeing that in inflation, you're seeing that in, in sheer demand for goods. What you're not seeing yet is the service sector. The service sector's in great shape. Mm -hmm. Education, um, leisure, healthcare, solid, both in terms of inflation as well as demand. So you've got an economy that's, that's actually in pretty good shape. I think people underestimate, while well, the economy's gonna slow, the goods sector is gonna slow. You're seeing that embodied in commodity prices, home builders, et cetera, but the, um, Service economy, the US, you know, US economy is two thirds consumption, is two thirds service. It's hard to bring that down. That's exactly what I wanted to ask you about with regard to where we sit right now within this shift. Because what we've heard so far from the banks that have reported, even from the airlines that have reported, we spoke with Delta CEO, and they're talking about this shift in goods to services really, really benefiting the experience economy as well. Is that something that if you look out into early 2023, even further into midway through 2023, that that remains, that demand remains strong and solid enough uh, as consumers are still looking across their own balance sheets where we've seen that go from, as the banks would describe it as strong, to now just healthy, if you will? I mean, I, you know, I mean listen, there is, you know, when you lift fuel costs and food costs as much as they have, it definitely has an effect on consumption generally. But gosh, if you said, you know, will the service sector continue to hold up? You still have got, you look at where wage levels are relative to anything we've ever seen in history. You look at where, you know, the amount of savings that's built up. My sense is the service economy will continue to, continue to do well. By the way, it's an aging demographic. The demand for healthcare services is not, is not going anywhere other than up from here. So I still think you've got a solid service economy. You know, people 
laments where the economy has slowed to. But keep in mind, we had double-digit nominal GDP last year. We're mm. slowing from that, and you're still going to have nominal GDP this year. That's going to post an impressive number that could be closer to five. So still pretty good. Are we slowing? Is a good sector slowing? Yes. But by the way, it's very different in commodity-oriented economies. It's very different in, in parts of China today, although we think next year will be better. The emerging markets are tougher. But And by the way, we go to Europe, and this is what's creating a lot of the vol. Mm. You know, in Europe, when you when you lift fuel costs as much as you have historic, and then you look at the UK, you look at mortgage rates spiking higher, you know, consumer 70% of their consumption basket gets now eaten up by just their utility bill and their mortgage. So you think about how difficult that paradigm presents itself. But U.S. relative to the rest of the world is in reasonable shape. All right, let's leave it there on, a, on that hopeful note. Good to see you in person there. BlackRock's Chief Investment Officer of Global Fixed Income, Rick Reeder. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Thanks for stopping by. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys.